best speakers that I've ever seen. And I, the sad thing was I didn't listen to him for years. You know, I was able to lose 40 pounds. I, at times, actually, you could say 50 pounds. In 2008, when I spoke, I was close to 200 pounds. I'm about, well, you guys are on, on uh, that other thing. But, uh, but no, man, I, I lost like a quarter of my weight, you know, by switching my diet, working out with some of the best fitness people and having information on some of the best fitness and diet and even doctors. So what we got today is Mark Ottobrick. Man, yeah, yeah. Ottobrick. I'm so sorry, but the, the thing is, is uh, he's talking about some of the ways to treat your body the way that you should, right? Supplementation, fitness, the importance of it, and the mentality of why you would need to live with that mindset and make your life better. I'll tell you this before I bring him on stage. What I've noticed in these conventions, uh, what guys walk away with the most, it has nothing to do with stuff that I say. I wish, I wish it was, but it has everything to do with what guys have done with their fitness, body, and lifestyle, and that's going to come from the guys like this. So come on stage, man. I'm excited to hear. Take it away, brother. Cool. All righty. Thank you all for having me here. You could be anywhere in the world, but you're here with me today, so you know, big props and big thanks. So my name's Mark Atobri, or otherwise known as Maximus Mark. I have a blog, uh, and obviously I'm the uh, owner of Enterprise Fitness, which is a personal training company. Before we get rolling, I just want to make mention to a couple of things, which is in context. I just want to know so I can kind of deliver a more tailored speech for you guys today. Who in the room is more after the, I guess, uh, health point of view of wanting to know what they need to do with their health, just by a show of hands, okay? Who would be more interested in hearing about, I guess, the performance aspect of how do I increase my bench press, how do I increase, you know, get six pack, all these other things? So it's probably more towards the performance and fitness, which is good to know, good information. So um, we'll get rolling. So firstly, about me, why do you want to listen to me for the next hour? Well, I'll tell you my story in brief so I can give you as much content as possible. This was me as the, uh, the fat kid at school. I was always picked last at sport. I wasn't particularly athletic at all by any means. I uh, wasn't particularly good at school. Very low self-confidence about myself. And the reason that I love sharing health and fitness, the reason I do, is because of the fact that this is where I started. And this was the vehicle for me to transform my life. For some of the other speakers, the vehicle for them to transform their life was, you know, learning about pickup and all the other things. But for me, it was health and fitness. So that's pretty much what I've dedicated to my life to ever since. My first, I have a fair bit of uh, experience in terms of bodybuilding competitions. This was my very first bodybuilding competition. I weigh about uh, 60, uh, 88 kilos, 87 kilos any day of the week. This was me at just 68 kilos, moments away from hospitalization before my first bodybuilding comp. So when I say I did everything that you could possibly do wrong, learning about health and fitness, I did everything possibly you could do wrong. I mean, after my first comp, I put on 14 kilos in the space of three days, yeah? So I wasn't particularly healthy, which was the void. And please write this down. Your voids in life dictate your values, okay? So if you don't have health, you will search for health. If you don't have money, you will search for money. Okay, if you don't have women in your life, you're going to search for women. So your voids dictate your values. So for me, it was health and fitness. It was performance. So that motivated me, that inspired me to go out and learn as much as I could. I wanted to be the authority in the world to, to really get this message across of how to do things the right way. So I competed a few other times. This was my last comp that I did, which was in 2007. And I've got to be honest with you guys, competing, as much as it was fun at the time that I did it, you know, I don't compete anymore. It's, I, I rather focus on the strength sports, getting my squat up, my deadlift up. That's what's more inspiring to me. However, I do this, some photos of me here, just recently taken. Um, that's me lifting, I think it's about 200 kilo, 210 kilos on a um, fat bar at a strongman comp, which, which I won the under 90 kilo division. So you know, I, I train, and you know, for me, it is all about performance. But since then, and learning what I've learned and the lessons along the way around nutrition, I've been able to create quite a, a fair bit of success for my clients. And these are just some of the clients who I train and coach. This is actually Janet Kane. Janet Kane's a four-time Miss Australia, uh, three-time Miss Olympia. So she is, you know, quite uh, bona fide. She's the best female figure competitor in Australia. Uh, won pretty much every title that the IMBA has to offer. And that's her just winning her fourth Australian title with me backstage. At one of our comps, I coached six girls this year, and I do do a lot of work with fitness girls, so or figure and competing uh, physique competitor, so fitness models. Um, at one of the comps, I had three girls compete; they all won their divisions. So you know the methods work. Uh, that's my beautiful fiance, uh, Christine. 
she competed as well. She won her division. Caroline won the fitness model division. Belinda, she won the intermediate uh, at the same comp. These are other girls that I've worked with. Uh, so the list goes on and on. Amanda, she won uh, the VIX this year. Lauren transformed her body completely, as you can see. Uh, Jenny, she was a mum of four. Marshall is actually in the room, and uh, he met me at 21% body fat. Now he sits at about 13. He got down in those photos, he was about 8.6. The reason why I show, this is another guy, he actually, interesting story with this guy. He met me around 2006. I taught him my philosophy around nutrition, which is what I'm gonna essentially teach you guys today. And he went over to Vegas to be a DJ. And he essentially, someone said to him, hey, you look good, basically. Why don't you do some modeling? He did some modeling and now he works as a model in Las Vegas, you know, not bad. Um, Two-time Mr. Australia, Tristan Boyce, who I used to work coach in 2009. Eros is actually one of our trainers at Enterprise Fitness. This transformation was eight months. This is Aiden. Um, more boys that I've, I've coached to be on stage. So the reason why I show you that, those photos is not to, you know, look, wow, look at all these photos. You need to get in that shape. No, no. It's to impress upon you that you know, what I'm going to teach you guys today and the philosophy, you can pretty much tailor it to whatever level that you want and that is right for you. It's not about competing on stage. You know, it's seriously not. It's not the point that I'm trying to get across. It's about you maximizing your own health and fitness. So before we get rolling, one of my philosophies, and I see this a lot, and I mean, there's probably some of the other uh, coaches uh, who, and speakers who spoke yesterday who, who kind of, James Marshall definitely this morning, touched on this topic. And people come in and they come to see me and they want to know what to do because they want to have the result. Now, I'm going to present to you guys, it's not about what you do and it's not about what you have. It's about the person that you become, okay? So there's a formula and essentially I'll just write this formula over here and that is B, as you can see on the board, do and have. Now, a lot of people say to me, you know, Mark, I want to have a great body. I want to have the six pack. I want to have all that. What do I have to do? Now, that's working with someone on a very superficial level because the fact is, and I was speaking to someone at lunch, I can give you a 12-week, in this case, it was a ketosis diet. I can give you a 12-week ketosis diet. You can lose a whole bunch of weight, but if you're not the person mentally to ma maintain and sustain those results, you're going to screw it up. It's like 97% of lottery winners you know, uh, go broke within three to five years okay, after winning the lottery. Why? Because they're not that person. So in your quest for knowledge, don't look at things that you have to do to have the result. Look at the person that you have to become, okay? And it's really super mega important because, let's face it, the person that I am does not allow me to go to McDonald's, okay? It does not allow me to use things like canola oil, margarine, even drink Coca-Cola. And people will say, oh, you know, you have a restrictive diet. I don't have a restrictive. I eat whatever the hell I want, whenever the hell I want. It's because the, what's between my ears is the person who I am. I have a healthy identity about myself and a healthy relationship with food. And I am someone who loves to be physically active. So that is what I'll encourage. And that is what I, that's, that's the main goal of this presentation is to get that. Obviously, there's things that you have to do around that. But once you be that person, it becomes very, very easy, almost effortless. So there are four factors into getting the body that you want, okay? There's nutrition, training, supplementation, and the key one is the mindset. And that's what I just touched on before, okay? That is key. Who do you be? You know, what does a healthy person do, okay? If I was this healthy person, what actions would I do? Then the actions, then you will have the result that you want to have, and then almost seamlessly overnight, you'll have lost 10 kilos or put on some weight or whatever the case may be. So my favorite analogy in terms of teaching all this stuff and teaching nutrition, I'll just put this down, is this analogy here, because it kind of puts in perspective, uh, I guess, my philosophy around what and how we were designed to eat and the foods that we should eat. So we all know Australian rules football, at least I think we all know. Hands up for those who know Australian rules football. Okay, go on the pies. I don't even beg for the pies, but most people do, so why not? Okay, so Australian rules football, Basically, the oval looks like that. Now, what I'm going to use this as a, reputation, uh, a representation of is the time frame in which the uh, human species has been on the planet. Now, there are people that will argue the human species has been on the planet for as much as 15 uh, million years. There are other people who will say, no, 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 it's only 2 million years. So for argument's sake, we'll just say this whole oval represents the past 5 million years of human evolution. Okay? So if we all go to the MCG today, 
and we walk from here all the way up to this goal square here. Can I just move this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. move this in the side, Actually, sorry. Just going to get yeah. this a little bit further up. No problem. Sorry about that, man. Keep going. Easy. So if we walk all the way up to this tiny little goal square here, that represents pretty much, you know, most people say, well, you know, maybe 4.5 or even 4.9 million years, okay? That, that, whole t that whole field there. If we look at this tiny little goal square, that represents the last 10 to 15,000 years of human evolution. Now, does anyone know why that's significant? Yes? Agriculture was introduced. Absolutely very, very good. Agriculture was introduced in the last 15 to 10,000 years. This tiny millimetre, which the guys in the back, back row can't even see me writing in, is the last 100 years. Okay? Now, what I'm going to suggest to you guys is that we go back to eating and living in this period here, not this period or this period. So it's very, very simple. Essentially, what did we eat in the last you know, five billion years? We ate things that were hunted, we ate things that were fished, we ate things that were gathered, and we ate things that were plucked. Okay? We drank water, and we essentially slept half our lives. Okay? And we slept half our lives without cell phones, or computers, or aquariums next to our head, or anything that vibrates next to our head. We slept res uh, restfully and peacefully. And sleep, by the way, guys, is often the most underrated uh, tool in terms of increasing guys' testosterone, fat loss, muscle building. It has a massive impact. If you guys don't sleep, you know, please do talk to me after, after this presentation because we can talk about that because it is, for me, working with clients, that is the first thing that I support to get someone sleeping. The reason being, I'll tell you, it's no secret, the reason why I want people sleeping restfully is because it increases compliance. So if I say to someone, you know, you're going to do this, 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 if they sleep well, they're more likely to comply because they've rested well. So it's no secret why I do that. So as we said before, this is the introduction of grains into the diet. And this tiny hundred, you know, years, millimetre, that represent in incandescent to the human eye, represents the last hundred years of food industry. So what it represents, essentially, is things like canola oil. It represents things like KFC, obviously, McDonald's, the 24-7. You know, we didn't have seasons 24-7 here. It looks at Coca-Cola, uh, things like high fructose corn syrup, which was only developed in the 70s. Um, by the way, canola oil, margarine, all the trans fatty acids were only uh, developed in 1911. Uh, so shortening, all these foods are last 100 years. Our genes, genetically, as a species, have evolved exactly 0.02% in that time frame. So in other words, we haven't adapted to this diet at all. Nothing. There's no, the, the adaption actually is all these autoimmune diseases, it's diabetes, it's bad skin, pimple, all these uh, westernized diseases that we now have, that is the ad adaptation. It's not a positive one by any means. If we want to be lean and muscular and have you know, boundless energy, we need to do certain things. We need to reduce the toxic load in our body, okay? All foods essentially in this past, if it has a label, you know, you want to eat foods that essentially don't have labels, okay? You know, if you're drinking chocolate milk, um, you know, just remember chocolate milk is actually, most of the time, the worst, uh, when milk is manufactured, it is all the gunk and the blood and all the other stuff because chocolate milk is the easiest to color. So if it's all the blood and stuff, that's essentially what you're drinking, yeah? It's, it's not good for you. And it's obviously loaded with sugar, preservatives, all that. It's a toxic load on your body, a toxic load your body doesn't need. So coming back to this, just to recap on what we've talked about, things that are hunted, fished, gathered, and plucked. Now, there's a very uh, important book that was written in nutrition. It was written by a man named, actually I won't write it, you guys can write it down, a man written Weston A. Price. Weston A. Price was a dentist in the 1930s, well actually he was a researcher primarily, but he was in the 1930s, to, you guys are smiling along because you know exactly where I'm going with this, 1930s to 1940s. And he had a fascination with teeth. teeth. So what he did, his life's work was to go around to, I think it was 21 countries off the top of my head, or maybe it was 14. He wrote a book called Nutrition and Physical Degener Degeneration, and he uh, photographed all different um, cultures, uh, both who were influenced by a Western diet and those who ate their native diet. And he looked at their teeth, and he found that the people who ate the native diet had, you know, perfect teeth and drew a correlation. The thing is, with the hunted fish gathered and plucked law, the reason why I bring up Western price is because what you eat essentially is a little bit based upon where you come, come from, genetically, okay? So, you know, for example, if you come from a Maori descent, 
or if you're like a, an Inuit, you know, you guys probably didn't eat a lot of carbohydrates, or you ate very, very little, because all you ate was fat and protein. So especially the Inuit in the colder regions of the world, nothing grew there. All they ate was fish, fat and protein. If you went up more, you know, in the Swiss, looked at the Swiss culture, what they ate, with lots of dairy, vegetables, but it was mainly a lacto-vegan diet. They did eat meat, but again, that was based on availability. Meat was always based on availability. And one thing about Weston A. Price is he actually did search, for, and he thought he was going to see a, a vegetarian society. He thought that was going to be the healthiest, but he actually didn't see that at all. The only time people ate meat was always based on availability. And if you look at some of the, like the Lakota tribe, an Indian tribe, you know, they ate four kilos to two kilos, it's, it's reported, four, two to four kilos of meat a day. And they were one of the most, uh, you know, brutal, strong, physically uh, tribes, you know, that was ever recorded. So if you essentially, you know, when I go out, I've got to talk this, about this because essentially there are some social elements to eating like this that come with it. If you go out with your friends and you're like, all right, you know, I'm going to implement this, eat things that are hunted fish gathered and plucked into my diet. 90%, I would say, probably even more, but we'll just say 90% of people eat foods that are based in the last 100 years. So they eat foods off this you know, the rest of the time they might, you know, 9% of the time they might eat the grains and then, you know, 1% of the time they might eat here. So essentially people will look at me and they'll say it's not normal. Well, actually, looking at human evolution, I'm normal, they're common, okay? And that's a key mindset shift that you have to understand and you have to get. I'm normal, you're normal. If you eat off these foods, that is what's normal. This is just what's common, okay, these two here. So eat what's normal, not what's uh, common today. Eat what's normal based on your genetics. The other way I put it to people, you know, we've got Macs and PCs in the room. Now, it's essentially the factory operated and factory specified fuel. If we take out that Mac uh, battery and we plug it into that PC, the PC will run because it's a, it's a fuel source, but it's not the optimal fuel source for that PC. Okay, the optimal fuel source for that PC is the PC battery that was developed by the, the manufacturer, let's say in this case IBM, and that's what it needs to run on, okay? So we can run our bodies off these things here. However, they won't run optimal at all, okay? Uh, so moving on. So again, as you guys saw before, actually I'll leave that there. As you guys saw before, and excuse me, I will have to refer to the notes just to, uh, to uh, keep on track. But as you guys saw before, I do specialize in fast body composition changes, okay? So some of my recommendations, again, they're only recommendations that if you guys want to implement and change your, your physiques fast, is to eat every two to three hours, okay? Now, it's not something that you have to be absolutely religious about. If you're a healthy person and you're happy with where you're at currently, you don't have to eat every two to three hours, okay? But if you're, what I've found from my experience is that if you want to change someone's body composition in the shorter space of time, eating every two to three hours definitely has its benefits, okay? The reason being is because it uh, mitigates the effect of a hormone called insulin. Is, who here is familiar with the hormone called insulin? Everyone, excellent. So let me just put it to you like this. Insulin is essentially your, uh, I guess, the, the hormone responsible for storing body fat, okay? Now, it's not that insulin is a, I guess, quote unquote, bad thing, we need insulin. And if you look at it like this over the course of the day, okay, let's say we start our breakfast with a general way of which uh, most people do, which is, you know, Kellogg's Corn Flakes and, uh, you know, skim milk. By the way, anytime you hear low fat, just think chemical shitstorm, okay? You, you, again, coming back to my basic principle of things that are hunted, fish, gathered, and plucked, you want to get things as unrefined as possible, so as natural as possible. Milk was never meant to be low fat. Didn't happen. Okay, if you drank milk in the way it was supposed to come out of a cow, it had fat in it, okay? So, just to keep in mind. But if we have one of those breakfasts, your blood sugar raises, okay? Now, because your blood sugar elevates, there's a hormone that coincides with that, which I'll draw in red, which is insulin. So, insulin rises. And essentially, high blood sugar in the bloodstream is toxic. So, we can't have all this circulating blood sugar in the cell because it's going to cause a whole lot of damage. So essentially what insulin does is wrangles up all this blood sugar and drives it in to the muscle or to the liver, or if the muscle is full, uh, it will drive it into the fat cell, okay? Simple as that. So the way I, I describe it is, see, in, in, in coming back to the football overall, 
The only time humans or the Paleolithic human had access to high amounts of refined sugar was when? Does anyone know? No, well, actually, fruit, someone said fruits. Uh, fruits were, fruits today have been uh, commercialized, yeah? So fruits are a lot bigger, they're a lot sweeter. So yes, there was uh, fructose in the fruit, but there was also a lot of fiber in the fruit, and fruit in the Paleolithic environment was a different machine than it is today. So yes, there was sugar in there, but where I was going with this, like, there's also a lot of fiber in the fruit, okay? That's why we eat fruit, and fruit's not, you know, I guess, insidiously bad, but there was the fiber content there, and there was more fiber then than, you know, due to uh, farming the land and reducing soil quality and all those other things, and, and you know, uh, farming for bigger yields, fruit has been, you know, the nutrient value anyway has been diminished. The only time that humans really had access to refined amounts of sugar was when they stumbled across a beehive. Now, that wasn't every day, okay? And honey was protected by bees, so you couldn't get it every day, but humans would go at great risks to get that. So, essentially, this was the only time in the Paleolithic environment where we really had huge amounts, and even if we ate fruit, it would look more like that rather than bang, okay? So there's a different, different effect on blood sugar. So we've woken up in the morning, let's say this is 6.30, and we've had that high refined uh, cereal, which has elevated our blood sugar. We get in our car, we're not exactly being chased by a hungry lion to burn this off, yeah? It just sits there in our body. So obviously our muscles, uh, the glycogen stores in our muscle, the, the glucose in our liver, we don't need extra glucose, yeah? We're not being chased by the hungry tire. Tiger. So essentially, we will be more uh, prominent to store that as body fat. Okay? Simple as that. So essentially, to lose body fat, you really do need to manage your blood sugar. Okay? How do you manage blood sugar? Well, you guessed it. You manage the amount of refined carbohydrates you eat. So cut out all the white stuff, in other words. Yeah? White bread, grains, all that other stuff. Uh, okay. I haven't covered all these points. So a really easy way to do it, and I guess a, a quote-unquote meal plan, is with each meal, you want to pick a protein. Now, how do I define protein? Protein, I think quality protein. And by the way, I'm, I'm, some people get a, a misinterpret when I talk about things like this. I'm not an advocate of you know, factory farming or anything like that. I'm also not, definitely not a vegan. But I do encourage you all to go out and source the meat as high quality as you can afford. Okay, so if you can afford the organic meats and the better cuts like, uh, you know, kangaroo meat and all these other things, because kangaroo is obviously game, game is fantastic for you. If you can afford free-range eggs, if you can afford free-range chicken, I absolutely encourage you to go do that, okay? But essentially, you want to pick a protein, a quality protein source, okay? A quality protein source is not a protein shake. It's not a food product. It is an, uh, essentially something that was hunted or fished. You all got it? The other caveat is I'll make is on um, fish, so if you are going to get fish, one thing I would strongly recommend that you all do is buy fish from Australia and also buy smaller fish so you don't buy things like tuna and you don't buy things like shark or swordfish. The reason why, does anyone know the reason why I make those recommendations? Do you want to yell it out? Mercury, exactly right. Mercury is the reason. So um, to avoid a heavy metal toxicity issue, uh, I mean, it won't kill you if you have it, say, once a week or twice a week, but if you're having it every single day, which is what a lot of young guys do, I see it a lot of times, because it's cheap, it's easy, um, they eat a whole lot of tuna to get bigger, well, you also, and I, I can tell you firsthand, I've had my, you know, mercury tested and all that, back in the day, I was every single day, tuna, 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 tuna. My mercury, I've done a few detoxes, it's lower than what it was, but it's still there, yeah? So, to avoid going through a whole detoxification phase later in life, you know, don't eat as much tuna and don't eat as much shark. Especially things like whale, which the Japanese love. Uh, you know, <laughs> definitely don't eat any whale any, ever. You know, you, you don't need to eat that. It's also bad for the environment. Um, pick a green. Pretty basic. So you've got your protein, you've got your greens. So let's just say, you know, uh, one thing that I recommend uh, to make it easy on you guys to eat more vegetables is frozen greens. Okay, you can just go to your Coles, Safeway, wherever your supermarket is, and buy a whole bunch of frozen green vegetables don't make for one meal, yeah? Because if you make for one meal, you're going to be constantly making meals if you want to eat more and, and put on some lean mass. So essentially, get all your frozen veggies, put it in a big pot, put some hot water in it, you know, boil them up and keep them in the fridge, okay? And the best Tupperware that you can get isn't actually Tupperware. It's things like uh, ceramic pots or glass. If you can get glass, that type of thing. So you avoid the, the plasticity 
um, cross over when you're boiling things. Because obviously, if you've got hot vegetables and you put it in a plastic container, the plastic can leach onto the vegetables, yeah? So to avoid any, again, toxicity issues like BPA, BPA is uh, bisphenol A, is a compound that's found in all pla or most plastics um, that can transfer over to the food. You want to avoid that because it's actually an estrogen uh, by nature. It's a, 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 what you call a xenoestrogen or an estrogen mimicking compound. So you don't want to lower your testosterone, guys. Yeah, you want to keep that high. So you pick a green. Then, you, then it's about managing your carbs and fats. So a lot of people, uh, you know, saturated fat, for example, has a lot of bad rap. You know, everyone, you talk about saturated fat, oh, you want to avoid fat, you know, you don't have any fat. That's not entirely true. If you can get all, um, really high quality fats, like uh, avocado, coconut oil, organic butter, that's one thing that's very important to buy organic, a high quality olive oil, these things are very, very nourishing. And by the way, you're not going to, and that's the other thing with Weston A. Price I was talking about before, he called, you know, in, in, he actually looked at every tribe, and he found that the ones that had the highest, uh, he sampled, you got the butter, he analyzed the butter, and the ones that had the highest nutritional content in the butter were often the healthier cultures, okay? So butter has been around for centuries. It is a superfood. Don't be scared of butter, you know, cooking with it. I'm not saying, you know, get teaspoons and shove it in your mouth, yeah? But you can cook with butter, okay? Coconut oil is also very healing. You know, you want to mix and match depending on what you're cooking with, yeah? If you're cooking, let's say, minced meat, you might use coconut oil. If you're cooking fish, olive oil might suit that dish better but don't be scared of your fats. The fats that you do want to 100% avoid and get rid of, if you go home to your, your mum's house, go to your dad's house, even at your home, girlfriends, whoever it is, if you see margarine or canola oil, just chuck it in the bin, yeah? That's the best place for it. They're the poisonous fats. And especially when I do a lot of body fat testing, I do a lot of body fat testing. Actually, I do biosignature testing. When I do that, I can always tell the people who have a high amount of uh, canola oil in their diet because their fat is a lot harder, okay? So you definitely want to reduce those, or not reduce, cut them out all, all entirely. Get the proper fats in your diet. They're very, very healing, very, very important. Now, I was talking before to someone about a ketosis diet. Essentially, there are two main type of, uh, I guess, genotypes, if you will. There's what you would call a carb type. Actually, I write it here on a different page. There's a carb type, a fat type, or another way to say it, a carb type would be a slow oxidizer, and a uh, fat type would be a fast oxidizer. So essentially all that means is, are you better suited to a slightly higher carb diet or are you better suited to a protein and fat diet, yeah? Um, general recommendation, you know, don't, if you're wanting to put on weight, you're gonna need to eat a mixture of both. If you're wanting to lose weight, you know, do lower your carbs a little bit. But the carbs that you absolutely want to include in your diet are fibrous carbs, which are again, your green vegetables, yeah? You, I mean, in nutrition, everything is debatable. Everything, except for one thing, eat green vegetables. But even then, that's debatable, yeah? So you, you wanna make sure you're eating plenty of vegetables, regardless of whether you're a carb type or fat type. The carbs, generally, that I recommend people to eat, again, this is depending on how much carbs they can tolerate. Um, if someone was wanting to lose weight, pretty much for the first two weeks, I would suggest they stick to sweet potato and pumpkin until they're happy with how much body fat they've actually lost. Yeah, so lots of protein, lots of vegetables, sweet potato, pumpkin. As they get leaner, they might use things like rice, quinoa, and be a little bit more fancy with their carbs. Fats, again, very basic. The ones that, again, hunted fish, gathered and plucked. If ever in doubt, just remember, hunted fish, gathered and plucked. Uh, I always, just one thing that I do with my, the guys who I get ready for shows and that type of thing, as someone gets leaner, let's say they're, you know, 6% body fat, I increase their carbs. I want to know how much carbs they can get away with. So again, it's not about dropping all carbs entirely. If you're wanting to put on weight, you know, if you don't think you're big enough yet, obviously, you know, have your rice, sweet potato, pumpkin, plenty of protein, you know, again. But even for the guys who want to put on weight, that's not a license to eat shit, yeah? Because sugar eventually will make you insulin resistant, which is a bad thing. You want to be insulin sensitive. Uh, and portions, which is often a question I get. I used to give, you know, this is what you should do. And for some people who I don't want to think, so for people who, you know, paid me, I need to get a result in 12 weeks, let's say it's a competitor, I'll give that. But for you guys, eat enough. You know, if you're hungry, eat. Don't be anal and, and measure your food and all that type of thing. Eat enough protein so you're not hungry. Or you can go two to three hours, or even four hours, without having a, uh, you know, to binge on something or being so hungry that you need something to eat, yeah? Just to check in with everyone so far, are there any questions before I move on? If you want to get a mic. Yep. 
Uh, sorry, you mentioned genotypes and that triggered mm -hmm. some biochemistry that I did at uni. Um, slow oxidizer, fast oxidizer. Uh, there's two genotypes. What's the dominance relationship there? Dominance? Um, Okay, it doesn't matter. You use genotype. Well, I use, as I said, for a lack of a better word, genotype, I just meant more generally two types of, I guess, uh, diets, essentially, that people would eat, okay? Someone who tolerates carbs better and someone who doesn't tolerate carbs better. So in the case of that, again, remember the example I gave was the Maori? The Maori wouldn't tolerate carbs as well, and that's something that I've seen when doing body fat tests. Um, they don't tolerate carbs as well to get their optimal body fat composition, okay? Whereas someone who, let's say from... Yeah, Swedish background, they will tolerate carbs a lot better. Okay, I'm using that as an example. Okay, so when I say uh, genotypes, it's just the differences in people, and even in, in races, you'll see differences in people. So I use that as a, as a broader term, if that makes sense. But can there be someone that's like a medium oxidizer? Yeah, okay, everything in physiology, great question. Everything in physiology is based on a continuum. Yeah, so you're going to have the extreme, you're going to have extremes on both sides, and you're going to have the in between. So that's why, for most people in the, wor in, in the room, this is why I recommend is they get, if, they, if there's body fat that needs to be lost, they lose the body fat, they get to a healthy weight, and then bring in the other carbs and the other foods. Because then they're going to see, oh, geez, you know, eating bread every day makes me fat. Or you know, if, if, if they're just kind of trying to do a little bit all the time, they're not going to see that, if that makes sense. Yeah. Do you test or, like, actually test, or do you so just trial I and test error? every client. I mean, like, like if you do, do just trial and error, okay. or do you actually get a specific test? So I use the biosignature. And on the, bi the biosignature was developed by Charles Poliquin, who's a world-famous strength coach. So I've been trained, done a lot of courses with Charles and a lot of his trainings. And the biosignature is essentially a 12-site body fat method. One of the sites is an overview of what your hormones are doing, okay? So one of the indicators is the upper back fat, and that is an indicator of how well genetically you tolerate carbs. So, for example, if I have a client working with them, if their lower back fat is really low, then I know that they're going to need to have more carbs. If it's really high, then... I know that it's probably a fat and protein diet. But then again, you know, in two weeks' time, I'm going to test them. So I've got their total body fat. Let's say they start with me at 20%. You know, in two weeks, if it's 18%, we're good. You know, there's not much change that needs to go take place. We're going to keep tracking and keep getting results. The, the body fat, the, the biosignature is a body fat test. So I've done a body scan before. Is that yeah, the same different. thing? No, no, different. you use it by hand. Unless you've had a, a biosignature practitioner do it, that's the, yeah, it's, it's, it's a specific protocol and... A method developed by Charles. Yep. Do you want to keep asking questions or do you no, want to continue? We'll, we'll keep going. Um, I'll, I'll continue with this and then we'll come back to the questions. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah, I just want to check in to see where everyone was at before we, uh, before we move on. Uh, okay, so this is half cut off. So simple things to improve body comp, and I'll need a re review to the board again, but here's a simple one. Cut all grains and gluten, okay? Gluten builds plaque on the brain. It slows you down. Some people are obviously more sensitive to gluten than not. My mentor on this topic is uh, Dr. Thomas O'Brien, who I actually did a podcast with, which you all can listen. I've actually done over 23 podcasts with world-famous health experts. That's at www.maximusmark.com forward slash radio, or you can search uh, Maximus Mark on iTunes. To have that. They're all free. You can download any of them and all of them. But the one on gluten, again, uh, Dr. Thomas O'Brien uh, quotes uh, some research and some papers where he says 70% of the population actually has some form of sensitivity to gluten, okay? So it's not only that's going to make you, you know, it's not, it's not about making you fat or overweight or any of these things, although as a side effect, when you do cut gluten, I always find people do lose weight a lot faster. If that's just the one change, you cut gluten for vegetables, you'll see a rapid change in body composition. I see that quite frequently. So that, that's the first thing, and minimizing grains and wheat. And most people do have some form, I find, the best test for this isn't actually a blood test. You simply do what you're doing now, you cut it. If you feel better in two weeks, great. They're probably not for you. Reintroduce it. If you find you get a lot of gas, wind, all those type of things, you have your answer. For some people, it doesn't affect, yeah? But if you're kind of one of these people, it's kind of like riding a bike, the same bike every day, and then you get a new bike and you didn't realize how bad your old bike was. Yeah, so they're things to watch for. Cut supermarket dairy. The reason why supermarket dairy is insidious is because you got to remember that two litre bottle of milk that's sitting in your fridge isn't from one cow, you know, it's from 10,000 cows. But then it's gone off into a truck, it's been homogenized and pasteurized, which is basically another word of saying bastardized. It's rapid heating, it's removed all the goodness out of that milk, and then it's been fortified with, you know, calcium, which milk should have calcium in it anyway, but because it's been pasteurized and homogenized, 
the calcium content is obviously diminished. The other problem with some commercial milk is you're not getting it from grass-fed cows. You're getting it from grain-fed cows. And the reason why they feed cows grain is because cows can produce it's something like 12,000 litres of milk more than if you fed them grass. Okay? So if you can get grass-fed milk, fantastic. Grain-fed milk, which is what you're going to be buying in your commercial, commercialized supermarket, isn't so good for you. As well, it's been, as I said before, pasteurized and homogenized. And that is, dairy is often linked, if there's any skin conditions in the room, obvious, most of the time dairy is linked, if you have any skin conditions, to an some form of intolerance to dairy. So that's a good one to know. But again, with all of these, if you cut them out, simply as, oops, cut them out, if you feel better cutting them out, then you know you have your answer. Where should you buy milk from? So you didn't hear this from me. Again, this is only a recommendation, right? It's not, it's not what I'm saying to do, because you know this is what I would do if I was buying milk. Um, I go to the Queen Victoria markets and I buy raw milk. Okay, it's called bath milk. In Australia, it's illegal to sell raw milk for the consumption, but it's not illegal to sell raw milk to use on your skin. So of course, when I buy it, I'm soaking my feet in it, yeah? Um, Soy, cut soy. Soy is an estrogen mimicking, uh, basically soy is estrogen mimicking full stop, disrupts thyroid. 95% of the world's so soy supply is genetically modified food. Now, to do genetically modified food justice, I probably need a whole presentation on its own. The guy who I like to listen to about genetically modified food, his name is, is Jeffrey Smith, and he's from responsibletechnology.org. Um, basically, in a nutshell, you, uh, they've genetically modified the soybean so it's, it produces its own amount of pesticides so that when you spray the soybean with pesticides, it is pesticide resistant, if that makes sense. So they're splicing. The way they found uh, the, genetically modif the genetic resistant gene was because a company by the name of Monsanto was dumping, dumping pesticides in this, I guess, dump, and there was a, an algae that was growing. And they go, oh, that's interesting. We're dumping pesticides. Nothing should live here. So they got the, the sample of the algae, and they sampled it, and they found there was a gene that was resistant to the pesticides. So they go, OK, well, we can play with this, manipulate it, and insert it into the, the soybean, plant the soybean, and then spray you know, acres and acres of pesticide over that soybean, which, by the way, pesticide in itself is uh, a xenoestrogen. Xenoestrogens, again, are just estrogen-mimicking compounds. As males, we want to promote testosterone, not estrogen. Even in females, the xenoestrogens are insidious. Okay, so it's not just males. Xenoestrogens altogether are, are, are bad for your health because they disrupt the natural balance of your uh, endocrine system. Okay, so that they're not good for you, in other words. Summary. So soy is bad for a number of reasons. Uh, and another good book if you want to t talk more about soy. Actually, you don't have to buy the book. Go onto westernaprice.org and search soy. You'll see plenty of articles by a lady by the name of Kayla D. Daniels. She's done the most, probably the most work in popularizing why soy is bad for you. No trans fats. Uh, I say to people, you know, these are things that won't add to your health. You want to avoid them as much as possible. What are trans fats? Well, be basically any of your vegetable oils, margarine, uh, canola oil, all of these things. You want to, again, hunted fish, gathered and plucked. Canola oil, margarine, developed around the night. Well, trans fats, shortening, was developed in 1911 by the, uh, a company by the name of Procter & Gamble. Canola oil became obviously popular after that, but yeah, not good for you. I have in point number five is actually meat, a protein goal, and I've spelt meat as in meat, a protein goal, like eat meat, eat red meat, eat white meat, eat fish, eat meat in your diet. If you're not so big on meat, at least have it once a day, yeah, have some meat, especially as males, you, you're going to need it. Yeah? If you're wanting to build mass and build muscle, Look, there are some people who do vegan diets and they build muscle. They get lean. I've never gotten anyone lean on a vegan diet. I don't know anyone who's gotten anyone lean on a vegan diet. I'm sure it's possible. Do I do it? No. Do I recommend it? It's not what I do. Yeah? If you want that, speak to a vegan who's had success in that. And just a, a side note on that, I interviewed um, Leah Keith, who she wrote the book The Vegetarian Myth. So if you're into the politics of food, I do have a podcast about that. And she wrote a book after 22 years of being a vegan. She wrote the book called The Vegetarian Myth. And it's a fascinating look at why vegetarianism isn't the diet that is going to essentially do all these things that vegans claim, which is, you know, the, the morals of a vegan is not what's bad. You know, justice, compassion for animals, that, that, is, that is absolutely spot on. It's just how they go about doing it, supporting things like soy and wheat. If you're not, you know, if you're not eating uh, localized food, essentially if you're a vegan, you're going to be eating a lot more soy and wheat, okay? 
Um, those companies are essentially the same companies that do the factory farming. Yeah, so Monsanto, Tyson, all these foods, it's a continuing cycle. So the only way to get off that treadmill, so to speak, is to buy local. I just gave you, a, I guess, a summary of that, but um, yeah, if you want more, it's there. Yeah, just look up on my website. Uh, eat plenty of green vegetables, which I've already covered. Okay, liquids. It's something astounding at the moment. I think it's around 40 or 50% of Americans uh, get approximately, actually, no, it's more. I think it's about 80% of Americans get around 50% of their daily calories from liquids, which is astounding. Right? So you're saying people are drinking around you know, 1,000 to 2,000 calories just from their liquids. That is insane. We were never designed to deal with that. That's why diabetes is on the rise. Okay, coffee is good for you, provided you buy it organic. Please do not buy decaf. When you get decaf, essentially it's all the chemicals that go in it to strip the caffeine away. Okay, so coffee is fine. Coffee is, a, is actually, there's a lot of polyphenols in coffee. And in research, there's actually science, they've shown that coffee drinkers compared to non-coffee drinkers live on average five years longer. Okay, so people who drink coffee, coffee, again, but you do, that's one thing, you do want to buy organic. And that isn't a license to drink, you know, six cups of coffee a day. One or two cups of coffee a day isn't going to kill you, yeah? Um, next one is tea. You can obviously mix and match your teas. That's another one you want to use loose, loose leaf teas. In the tea bag, uh, what's the compound? I think it's hexanes or, no, it's not. It's chlorinated. It's bleached. The tea, often tea bags are bleached. That's not so good for you, yeah? So if you're going to drink a lot of tea, if tea is a normal part of your diet, uh, use loose leaf tea, okay? And obviously water. Oh, both. Either or. Uh, not to quote me on this, but I think one is better for, I guess, heart disease and the other one's better for, yeah. It's, it's like you, which study you look at will show one is better for this, one is better for that. But nutshell, coffee has a lot of antioxidants in it. Uh, tea is very anti-cancerous uh, or has anti-cancerous properties in it. Say, for example, green tea. But again, key factor there is you buy loose leaf tea. Okay? So it's not coffee or tea. Use both and obviously drink plenty of water. A, 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 an easy thing for most people to do is to just simply cut out all saf, soft drink as of today. You know, we develop this taste, and again, you've got to remember about food manufacturers and food industry is they develop food so that we can consume more. Okay, so in other words, uh, you know, it's not uncommon for people. Actually, here's an interesting stat: since 1975, uh, food was growing, uh, food industry, sugar consumption, I should say, was growing 1% a year. That 1% growth was based upon food uh, population growth. Since 1975, or uh, after 1975, uh, sugar consumption has grown up to 5% per year. Now, that 4% gap, essentially what that is, is they figured out pretty early on that the more sugar that you add to food, the more people consume. Okay, so you can downregulate appet uh, people's appetite hormones, such as leptin, which is a, you know, specifically correlated to appetite, you can downregulate people's appetite hormones if you give them more sugar. The other thing that Coca-Cola do is add sodium to the Coke, which makes you thirsty, which essentially makes you want to consume more. So you're not missing out on anything by cutting out soft drink. You actually live longer and drink more water, which you'll be better hydrated and better be able to perform. Yeah? So drink plenty of water. Uh, this one, oh, this is just a note on supplementation. Supplements that I recommend and I like to take pretty much all year round. Uh, magnesium, because there's over 300 biochemical functions uh, in the body that is due to magnesium, and it's also clinically the most efficient mineral that you'll see. Next one is zinc, because it's synergistic to every single other uh, vitamin and mineral. And the other one is fish oil, but generally fish oil is not something I take all year round. Reason being, if I eat a diet that's say, you know, a lot of meat in my diet, if I get an order, which I do, I order my meat from a, a farmer, if I get an order of 40 kilos of, of organic grass-fed cow, I don't need a supplement with fish oil because the cow has plenty of omega-3s in it, okay? But if you're, you know, just starting your health kick, fish oil is definitely a good supplement to take. Now, one caveat on that, don't just go and buy out any random fish oil, any random zinc, or any random magnesium. It needs to be formulated the right way. So one of the things that you'll find with fish oil especially is only 12 companies in the world that make uh, ethical fish oil. And what I mean by ethical fish oil is fish oil that's actually sourced in a part of the world where the fish is clean. So if you go to the chemist and you buy, you know, 10 bucks for 400 pills of fish oil, guaranteed it's going to have heavy metals in it, okay? You want to buy all your supplements generally from a practitioner range. Some practitioner ranges that are good are obviously Poliquin is the one that I, I recommend and use. Other brands are things like Thorn, Metagetics, um, if you do, do a Google search, practitioner brands, they're the main ones. That, Douglas Labs would be another one. 
they're the main ones that, you, you, that are safe. Okay? And magnesium is a big one because magnesium, most people don't formulate it the right way. So it's unabsorbable magnesium. So for example, I could give you a magnesium that's unabsorbable that will make you go to the toilet. Okay? That's why it makes you go to the toilet because it's unabsorbable. But you want magnesium like a magnesium orotate or a fumarate which, or a uh, taurate, which is good for the heart, muscles, all the other things. So it needs to be formulated right. Magnesium oil, a, oh, topical magnesium that you rub into your skin, very good. Again, but even that you need to make sure. Generally, a magnesium, a topical magnesium will only be formulated by a practitioner company because they're always ahead of the curve. Yeah? I use topical magnesium from the Polycon range. Uh, it's fantastic. I, I really do like it. I'll, I'll hold, I'll, I'll get like, sleep like a baby, okay? Uh, so sleep rules for you guys. Now, there's a study done, uh, and T.S. Wiley, who's probably one of the best people I've read on the topic of sleep, uh, she quotes a study in her book that's called Lights Out, and I also had her on my podcasting show. She quotes a study where essentially they measured the melatonin. Melatonin is the hormone of sleep. Okay, they measured the melatonin of a young male, and then they put a uh, five cent fiber optic cable, the size of five cents, uh, fiber optic cable on the back of the knee, and then which shot out light and measured the melatonin again, and they produced 80% less melatonin. The take home from that is if you wanna have deep, restful sleep, okay, you need to sleep in a pitch black room. What is a pitch black room? If you put your hand in front of your face, you can't see it, okay? Get rid of all the light in your bedroom, okay? Do it today, you will sleep better. Your phone, if you use your phone to, who uses their phone to wake them up? Keep your hand up if it's at least four meters away from your head. Okay, so good on you guys for getting it four meters away from your head. But don't sleep with a phone next to your head. Pitch black. Do it for three days and you will notice the improvement in the way you wake up. If you can't sleep, okay, if you, you have trouble falling to sleep, definitely go grab yourself magnesium. The other thing that I'd recommend is that you start to implement a wind down process. What's a wind down process? Is when you go home after your, after your job, you've been sitting in sunlight, oh, sorry, you've been sitting in... Uh, Office light, which essentially our brains don't understand, it thinks it's sunlight, right? So, which it switches off the, the, our brain to produce melatonin. So, we're sitting in this, this artificial sunlight, which our brains aren't making melatonin. Then we go home, we switch all the lights on. What does our brain think? It's another day. It's not time to wind down yet. So, we need to tell our brains, because our, our genes, our hormones, are all based on external factors, basically. Okay? So, I mean, if you, you know, food, women, Sleep, night, day cycles, all these things tell our bodies that this is what we're supposed to be doing, okay? If we put you in a room that just has, you know, sunlight all the time, we don't get the, we're tired, but we can't sleep. So if you, you have trouble sleeping, implement a wind-down process. That wind-down process is turning off the lights or at least putting the lights to the side of you while you work on your laptop or watch TV or whatever it is, okay? So sleep like a baby. Oop, skipped one. Uh... Okay, the next one, if you want to change body composition fast, is that one that's obviously cut off, is get yourself a good coach, a trainer who understands this thing. And obviously not all trainers are created equal. What I would look for in terms of coaches and trainers is someone who has been trained by Poliquin, okay? Obviously I'm biased, being a PICP coach, biosignature practitioner, having done a lot of courses and spent a lot of time with Charles himself, but you know, to be fair, it is probably, when I look at uh, the, the industry, the fitness industry, and I look at who are the best trainers and who are the most safest, and if I'm sending a client to someone in an area that, you know, obviously I'm in Melbourne, I'm based in Melbourne, but if I have a client who says, I'm moving to Sydney, who should I go see? It is a Poliquin coach, yeah, because we, we all receive a very high quality of training. Oops, I think I skipped that one. So, very, very simple. This slide is basically saying that there's two sets of hormones. There's your survival hormones and there's your replication hormones. Obviously, we want to be doing things from a place of replication. Healthy people can reproduce, okay? Simple. If you can't reproduce, you're probably not optimally in shape, okay? So you want to hardwire things. And again, I haven't seen any healthy people who are out of shape, if that makes sense. But I've seen plenty of people who are in shape, shape who aren't healthy. So if you focus on health, you will get in shape. Do things that are healthy. Don't worry about, oh, I have to lose body fat. Just focus on getting healthy, yeah? So training. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you a couple of quick points and things that you probably need to go out and research a bit more. But the thing with training, and, and again, on break, I think I was speaking to someone before. They said to me, I'm doing this program. Is that good? Well, it's good for four weeks. That's it. Four to six weeks. Because the human body is an adaptative machine. 
you essentially, what we do at Enterprise Fitness, so we get a client, let's say, this is week zero or week one, I should say, you know, we look at them in phases, okay? And we say, all right, what's the first goal? Where do you want to go? Right? And they might say, all right, well, I'm 25% body fat, which is quite high, okay? You know, I, I want to get lean. Okay, well, the goal is very simple. It's fat loss, okay? So we orientate a program for fat loss. But they might lose 10 kilos in eight weeks, which brings them up to here. So that's the eighth week fair. So then we focus on strength. One key concept to get, you can't always be focused on building mass. You can't always be focused on building strength. And you can't always be focused on building fat loss. But when you are, you focus on that one thing. You might get the other things, but you, I write training programs based around the most important thing. You, another way to put it, you can't go north and south at the same time. You can't. You just go around in circles. And this is often what I find with people. They either do training programs for way too long, or they do training methods. Let's say, for example, super eccentrics. Super eccentrics are great for four weeks. Then you need to go to the next thing. Why? Because this thing's called strength deficit. Super eccentrics will develop strength, but they won't develop speed. And speed, it's always easier from a strength coaching point of view to get a fast person strong than it is to get a slow person fast. So you want to have, to get strong, you want to have a fundamental base of speed in there as well. So you, you can't just keep doing the same thing over and over again. You're going to get, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Well, you're not going to get a different result. It's going to be the same result. Okay? So train hard, that's a fundamental. If you want to transform your body, train four days a week. Okay? If you're not so worried about transforming your body, you, know, you get into the gym two, three times a week, not a big deal, maintain. But if you want fast resu faster results, train four days a week. Okay? Uh, fat loss will come mainly from diet, or at least that's the goal. You don't, I don't recommend you, uh, you know, jump on a treadmill and do boring ass cardio. Yeah, we're all guys. We were designed genetically to get a rock, throw it at the rabbit, and then walk up to it and eat it. Yeah, we weren't designed to chase around a rabbit. Yeah, we were designed for anaerobic sports. That we're anaerobic machines. Okay, we're not aerobic machines. And often when you focus, unless you want to go out and do a marathon, which is a completely different topic, and that's completely fine if that's your calling, but essentially if you're training for optimal body composition, you want to be doing aerobic, uh, anaerobic activities. And the way I always explain it from a practical perspective is if you compare the body composition of a sprinter compared to a ma uh, marathon runner, I mean, the average marathon runner is very skinny, they might be lean, but they're not muscular. Okay? Now, if you're looking for optimal body composition, it needs to be anaerobic based. Uh, full range of movement, there's a saying that I, or, uh, I heard it just recently from a strength coach, a very good strength coach who I respect uh, very highly, and he sa essentially said to me that if someone can't get down, I'm being careful because I've got this in the back pocket, but if someone can't sit down all the way and hold this position, essentially there's something fundamental wrong in their physiology, okay? So full range of movement, what that means is you want to work everything that you do at full range. None of these, if you're on the bench press and you do these ones, that doesn't count. It needs to be full range for joint mobility, longevity, all those things. Um, obviously, the actually interesting point before we move on, the two biggest things, I speak to any good therapist, the most common injuries come from either leg press or Smith machine. Now, if you go to a fitness first on a Monday night, what are the two machines that are being used the most besides the treadmills? Smith machine and leg press. So, you know, get a coach. To, it's an investment in your training. Get someone to teach you how to train. You know, that, I mean, when guys come with us, we teach them, you know, we do everything in 12 weeks. If people want to continue after the 12 weeks, they're more than welcome. But the comment we always get is how much it's made a difference to their, you know, year after training and the year after that and the year after that. Because essentially, it was just that 12-week period where we intensely taught them what to do so they're now confident going into the gym by themselves and um, getting some great results and having some great workouts, Okay. Uh, full range of movement and respect reps and tempos. And what that essentially means is just simple rules for you guys when you go into the gym, not to hurt yourself. You know, don't do these ones on the bench press. You lower controlled, you explode. Everything you want to do, you want to be able to measure. So you never want to go into the gym, and especially working with athletes, you never want to go into the gym and go, oh, well, maybe you can do 100 kilos. No, they either did it or they didn't do it. So it has to, the, the tempo, the rep, everything has to be respected. Training goals, be clear in what's important. So here's the problem when working as a trainer, what I see most of the time, is people will come in and they will say, okay, what do you want to achieve? Why have you come to me today? And they will say, well, I want to get stronger. I want to lose body fat. I want to put on muscle. I want to increase my mobility. I want to get a bigger deadlift. I want to get a bigger bench press. Well, whoa, 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 whoa. The human body doesn't work that way, right? Pick one, 
And as a bonus, we might get the others, okay? So bit, what I'm saying is you've got to be clear on what you actually want to do. Yes, it is possible, and if I, could, if I showed you, had more time, I'd show you some clients that I've worked with. Marshall's in the room. He can attest to this. Often I get clients who lose body fat and they build muscle at the same time and they get stronger. But that said, I'm focusing their, my program and my sole efforts on the one thing, not the multiple things. Very, very important to understand. Be clear in this process of where you want to be. It's a lot easier for me as a trainer, as a coach, to look at someone and go, like a competitor, I, I train a lot of competitors, okay, your, your comp's in June, all right, we're in December now, yep, you've got this much time, we don't need you lean, we don't need your contest ready until about, you know, uh, well, June, April, maybe even May, we might leave it as much as May before we really start implementing changes, yeah? But this period here, you know, we're focusing on strength, getting them stronger, doing all the things that otherwise people wouldn't do. Because again, the problem is I find a lot of guys do this. Females are probably the worst offenders, but guys definitely do this as well, is they say, I want to get my abs, I want to get my abs. And there's a saying in strength coaching that abs on a skinny guy is like big tits on a fat chick. Doesn't count, right? <laughs> so if, if you don't have the mass that justifies abs, it, you will just look skinny in a t-shirt. You don't want to look skinny, yeah? Build some muscle first, then worry about getting lean, okay? So in that case, let's say you came to see me and you were 12%, but only 68 kilos. Well, let's bring up your body mass, maybe 80, 79, 80 kilos. Then you can worry about getting, focus on getting lean, yeah? So everything should be, uh, hang on. Yeah, never, I've already made the point about that. Everything should be put into blocks, which is basically a re reiteration of this. So again, one to four weeks, four to eight weeks, eight to 12 weeks. Again, I'm, any client I have, I'm developing their training program at least, the shortest program I ever write is 12 weeks, yeah? So I'm thinking about it from a 12 week perspective and then we continue on from there. So even some people like uh, Janet, who I showed the full time Miss Australia, 12 months in advance, I know what we have to be doing uh, 12 months in advance to get to where she wants to be. Uh, so just take a minute now and write down on that uh, blank piece of paper, what is specifically important to you right now in your health and fitness? Is it that you want to build some mass or is it that you want to, you know, uh, lose some body fat? Be clear. Or is it that you want to build some strength? Yeah? I love strength. Strength, honestly, all I really train for now is strength. I don't really care about anything else. It's just strength. Uh, that's me. I don't, I don't never train. I mean, if I do more than three reps, it's, yeah, Marshall knows, I'm not happy. Yeah? It's three reps, one rep, two reps, because I love strength. Yeah? But obviously, if I was wanting to do a fat loss phase, I'd be doing more reps. Yeah? Um, takeaways. Look at where you are, look at where you want to go, and remember that the human body is, a is an adaptative machine in pretty much everything that you do. And what I mean by that is you're not going to do the same thing every single day. Yeah? You're not going to eat the same foods every single day. You need variety. Eat lots of colors in your diet. Eat different meats. Eat different fishes. Variety is the key. But also in your training, you want enough sameness in your training so that you can measure improvement, e.g. squat is a good measurement, deadlift is a good measurement, bench press is a good measurement but you want enough difference, and that's every four weeks, so that the body never adapts. If you're constantly doing the same thing, same stimulus, same old, same old, same old, same result. You need to allow the body to adapt over that period. Supplements, again, I already covered this before, but just a reiteration. Multivitamins, zinc, magnesium, fish oil, must be in the right form. Training supplements that you could add to that are things like uh, branched chain amino acids, better alanine if performance is a, is a big thing, like if you're a strength athlete, if you want to burn more fat more effectively, carnitine's also very good, but they're kind of some general supplements, but if you had 50 bucks, if you gave me 50 bucks and you said, what are the most important supplements that, to spend my money on? The first one would be a multivitamin, then magnesium, then zinc, then fish oil, okay? Um, don't, the first 50 bucks should not be spent on protein powder, okay? Uh, you can eat real food, you don't need, it, it's more important to have a good multivitamin magnesium, in my opinion, than it is to have a protein powder. And by the way, just a note on protein powders, I'm not linked to any, you know, or I don't, I'm not sponsored by any supplement company. Um, powders in Australia are unregulated. So in other words, they don't have to meet a certain standard. Capsules are very good, but powders specifically are unregulated. So often what's in the label and what's in the product can be two entirely different things. So it's something you want to be aware of. You know, make sure that you buy powders. And again, protein powder is often one of the last things I tell people to buy, especially if you're on a budget, because of the fact 
that you can make it up with real food. I mean, when I train, you know, five minutes after, I just eat a real meal. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not a huge advocate of protein powders. So finally, before I start taking questions, you can like us on Facebook. It's Facebook forward slash Enterprise Fitness Australia. Uh, my name is spelt, if you want to add me personally on Facebook, it's Mark with a K, M-A-R-K, and it's O-double-T-O-B-R-E. My blog is Maximus Mark. The reason why it's Maximus Mark and not Mark Otobri is because Maximus Mark is a lot easier to say. Um, and what else we got? We've got the podcasting show. And um, yeah, you can connect with me. So now, happy to take your questions, whatever you guys can throw at me. This is going to take a little while. <laughs> but I think we got some time. We had somebody over here first, yeah? Um, how do you balance working out? So for me, I wake up at like 5 a.m. to go to the gym. Yep. And then on the weekends, I have to go to work at like from like 6 p.m. beyond midnight. And then your, your body cycle gets fucked up. And then yes, it does. Yes, it does. Um, I mean, for opt there's obviously in everything that I say, there's ideal and then there's realistic, right? You, it's always about, and there's some people who are, you know, I teach nutrition or whatever, and they have like an OMG about all the fact that I have to eat organic all the time and all this type of thing. For me, it's about always making the best decisions that you possibly can at that given point in time. So example, I just recently traveled to Rhode Island to do a course with uh, the Poliquin Strength Institute, and I was at the, airplane, uh, the airport. Now, everyone obviously knows airport food is pretty horrendous, okay? But I made the best possible choice that I could with what I had. What, that, what I could find was basically what I call chicken dust with salad, right? Has anyone ever got one of those salads where it's like two bits of chicken? Yeah, so I had chicken dust with salad. That's, that's all I had available to me, and that was the best choice I had. So for you specifically, you, you said that you train at, uh, the weekend is 6 p.m. To, to midnight? Two to 8 p.m. Yeah. It's in the morning. Yeah, that's fine. Well, why don't you train in the mornings? So you can train in the mornings on weekends? Yeah, I can only train, train in the mornings on the weekdays. Yeah. And then during the days, it's like going to school or work. Yeah. So I'm not sure I understand the question 100%. Um, Are you saying you don't have time to train on the weekends? It's like your sleeping cycle when you said about, uh, about sleep. Or are you saying after you train at, at, in the weekdays, you train at night and you can't get to sleep? Yeah, about going to sleep at proper time. You know when you said you have to have a dark room? Yes. So I go to sleep at like 10 p.m. Correct. To wake up early at 5 a.m. Yes. But then when on the weekend starts, when the weekend begins, like I have to go to work at like 6 to like 3 a.m. And then my whole week gets screwed over. Why so does sleep cycle changes from day to day? Yeah, so the sleep cycle is just screwed. So how is that a problem for you now? Uh, maybe I think that's about time management. Like, right. yeah, because there's not there's not a clear question. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so again, making the best choices that you have with what you've given. Um, I mean, again, what would help you is magnesium. I would get some magnesium. Having a wind down process, obviously, that's not ideal, and you work towards an ideal situation. That's what you got to do right now to pay the bills. That's what you got to do right now. But you know, six months down the track, you create that ideal situation. Yeah, I'm not sure if that helps. I'm going to move it over here. Um, love the Western price feel. Um, what's your opinion on like fermented foods and things like that? Like I don't think they do any harm. Okay. Um, obviously, there's different authors and that. I'm not an expert on fermented food by any means. Um, if you go on to undergroundwellness.com, which is a podcast with Sean Croxton, he's had a couple of really good fermented food podcasts. So you can find, I mean, I don't have any, anything against them by any means. Um, there's obviously a heap of different recipes out there. There's high in probiotics and prebiotics, so they can be quite beneficial. Yeah, again, it just obviously depends what and how you're doing it. Yeah. Use raw milk? Yep. Raw milk with kefir? Yep. yep. Yep, so that's something you may want to may wanna try. Yeah, for me, just to be honest with you guys, I'm pretty bare-ass basic, yeah? Um, I try and keep things as simple as possible because it's day to day for me. It's, it's a lifestyle. It's not something that I, um, you know, uh, stress too much about, so to speak. So I do things that I can constantly do. But every now and then, may I do some fermented food? Yeah, sure. Yeah. I eat a lot of uh, canned tuna. Yep. 
every day at work. Yep. So, um, do, do you recommend cutting it out completely? Or? Yeah, I, I, again, it's something I would recommend cutting out completely. You can always look at, um, I mean, there are some people genetically who have an unbelievable detoxification capacity uh, who it doesn't affect. They're the exception, it's not the rule. So for me, you know, testing things like mercury levels and that, you know, down the track, it can be very important. Like, you know, why all of a sudden have I woken up at the age of 35 and now it's a lot harder for me to do everything? Why, is, why do I have more fogginess in my thinking? All these type of things can be an issue down the road. Uh, let's say in your 40, because it has to be an accumulation that takes place. It's not something, unless you have a genetic predisposition to detoxifying mercury very, very well, it can be a problem. Yeah? Where do you get tested for that? You can get tested. Uh, there are a lot of different thoughts around the testing. I personally would go to the National Institute of Integrative Medicine. Actually, even better yet, I did a podcast with the head guy there. His name's Bruce Jones. He's one of the, the finest Australian functional medicine or integrative medicine doctors uh, in Australia. So if you listen to that podcast, he'll give you a lot of good things and he'll tell you the specific labs and that. But again, the, the, the real implementation of that, we don't do heavy metal testing. Uh, you know, you can do it through heavy metal analysis testing, which we can offer, but it's best to go to the NIM because if there is a problem, we would refer you to the NIM anyway. It's called the National Institute of Integrative Medicine and they're just in Hawthorne and Kew. Uh, yeah. Uh, thanks for the speech, Mark. Just a quick question. You're talking about uh, you went through a series of detox or uh, doing a detox on your body. What, what exactly was that, real quickly? Real quickly, uh, basically a whole lot of different supplements. Um, would milk this will be part of that? Do you take that for your liver, like within... Well, I never like took it. There's a lot of different arguments around milk thistle. I personally don't really use it with people. Um, I don't really use it myself. Yep. Can it be good? The only thing with milk thistle and most herbs, you don't want to overuse them, yeah? So I wouldn't use it for an extended period of time, milk thistle specifically. There's some, I, remember, I can't recall off the top of my head, but there, I remember reading something about it uh, over-functioning liberals. I can't remember exactly, so I would just be, I'd have to look it up to get back to you. Okay, you and alcohol? What do you, what's your thoughts well, on that? Well, obviously alcohol will hold your goals back, yeah? Um, and it depends on what you want. I mean, like the thing is there's, you have your values, I have my values. I have a high value on training. Yeah, a high value on looking good, a high value on getting up and performing at my best, right? Other people, they don't want what I want. They, they're happy with where they're at and they, they want to go out once a week and enjoy a drink. If that's you, fine, accept it. Um, it was a myth of discipline that goes around. I wish I could be more disciplined. No, that's not true. You have the values that you have and that's what dictates your life. If you want to get a better composition, body composition, you simply have to answer this question. I have more of a value on alcohol and drinking you know, every night or I have more of a value on getting the physique that I want. It's, it's just the choice, it's the decision. So will alcohol impact your physique goals? Yes. Um, will it absolutely destroy your physique goals? Well, you know, how much alcohol are we talking? If it's once a week, probably not. If it's every night, then yeah, it can definitely be an issue. All right, we got like six hands up and time for two more questions. We could probably make it three if we go super quick. And one is of our one of our speakers too. So, I've seen Anthony over there. <laughs> so just make it really quick, guys. Okay. Hey man, thank thanks for for your sharing. Okay, real quick. Um, Mark Sisson says uh, talks about uh, eating um, until you're full and mm -hmm. when you need to, and often that could be as little as twice a day. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're on paleo properly. So I just wanted your thoughts on that okay. versus eating yeah, yeah. three, four times a day. Absolutely, 100% get what Mark Sisson's saying, and I really respect him and what he's done for the industry. My only caveat with that is if essentially if you get someone who is quote-unquote unhealthy, and they are much more proponent to make bad decisions. So once you get someone healthy, then it's very, very simple. They can eat twice a day. Yeah? Sometimes I personally, I only have time to eat twice a day, three times, so it's not an issue. Yeah? If I am, however, wanting to change, someone's paid me the money, okay, change my body, you're eating six times a day. Yeah. So that's where I draw the line. It's, are you, are you wanting to change your body rapidly and fast, or are you just happy with where you're at and you're just wanting to maintain, build strength, and do things a little bit at a slower pace? So just, it's, it's dependent upon where you're coming at it with. And also, the other thing that I do, especially with weight loss clients, is I do tend to give them more meals, so there's less chance of them making bad choices. So I want to keep them more full throughout the day, so let's say if they go four hours, this is what happens most of the time, and I've done enough consults to understand this, if they go four hours without eating, their blood sugar crashes, what happens when their blood sugar crashes? Ooh, that Coca-Cola, that coffee, that Starbucks looks nice, 
I don't want you thinking that. You need to, that's why the, the regular feeds are important. Once you've made the transo transition over to a healthy identity, so to speak, then you don't really need to worry about it. It just is. It just, it's who you are. No problem. Hey, um, I took Vital Greens, another one of them, and for some reason it makes me sad and depressed. I wonder if that's the chlorella in it. Is it the chlorella? Cl uh, chlorella, I know it absorbs metals. Correct. Um, your body's probably not detoxing it fast enough. Actually, it's probably a B6 issue to be... that. Yeah, I'd say it's a B6. If you don't have enough B6, you're not going to be detoxifying fast enough. And because a lot of B6 and B12 is essentially good for the brain, mm. um, that can induce, like... Say, for example, with athletes, you see it. If they take too much BCAAs, branched-chain amino acids, to absorb BCAAs, you need B6. Uh, if they take a lot and they do it over time, they deplete the B6, and then all of a sudden, they have unexplainable bouts of depression. It's just a B6 issue, B12 and B6 issue. So you may want to supplement with something like a uh, your B6, B12 product or being in B9 product so um, apart from that uh, yeah that's something you just want to watch getting some heavy metal testing because if your heavy metals are high and you're taking that that can essentially just be moving it around the body right which isn't a good thing you want to get it out so that's where testing would come into play and if an issue like that I'd go see the NIM yeah. all right I think that's it unless somebody has one burning desire we do. We have one. Really, really quick. Here we go. I just real quick. I'm allergic to dairy. I was just wondering, what do you reckon is the best milk to get if you can't get dairy, like almond, oat, rice? My know. answer to that would be, why do you need it? Yeah, there's this conception in our Western environment that we have to have milk as a part of a balanced diet. I would like to challenge that. I don't think we have to have or have to do anything, so to speak, as long as it meets the rules of hunted, fished, gathered, and plucked. And that's a lot of the time when we think soy milk, almond milk, all these type of things. We don't have to be drinking them at all. They're, it's food processing and alternatives to people who are dairy-free, and they need to be dairy-free. If milk's not for you, milk's not for you. Move on. I, I don't drink pretty much any milk uh, in my diet at the moment. I did drink a little bit of raw milk here and there, but it's not a staple of my diet by any means. Or does it need to be? Awesome. Let's hear it for Mark Otobre. Maximus Mark, you got anything that you want to announce here sales-wise? Yeah. Cool. So I'll just do this quickly. Uh, I've got my 10-set DVD here. If anyone uh, is interested in learning more about what we do and what, uh, what I teach, that was taken for my one-day seminar. Uh, normally, I sell it online for $147. Today, it's 100 bucks. You can come see me at the back. I've got plenty here. So easy to, uh, it's 10 sets, there's over five and a half hours of content of me presenting about a variety of different issues from gluten to why you should never count calories to, you know, everything there, as well as uh, an hour of just Q&A like this. The other thing that we offer as part of Enterprise Fitness and my personal training company is we do 12-week uh, transformations, which you saw uh, before. Um, essentially, everything's included. We have options of once a week, twice a week, three times a week, and four times a week. Uh, we have somebody in the room who, Marshall, who's worked with our, us and our team, so, you know, if you're interested in that, come see me at the back. Or just, if you can't get hold of me today, I'm at, I will be at the dinner tonight. You can just Facebook me personally, um, you know, and I'll answer your questions. Sweet. Awesome. All right, guys, we got a, we got a quick, quick break.